And so, you know, a lot of patients say to me, you know, I, I understand that I have to be active, Dr. Machino, and, you know, I think I can live with 30 minutes, but, you know, I think you have it wrong there. You, you're asking me to do this every day, every day. I've been reading a lot of magazines. It's not every day. It's every other day. I said, let me tell you something, <laughs> seeing that I'm the doctor and you're the patient. <laughs> Once you achieve your ideal body weight, I'll allow you to go every other day. But to get to your ideal body weight, if you're overweight and out of shape, it's every day. <laughs> See, they would never say to me, I'll, after I show them the nutrition, I'm going to show you a nutrition plan here, the exact nutrition plan that works. I'm going to show it to you. And you're going to say, I, I, I could live with that. No one ever said to me, what kind of program is this? I have to eat food every day? I think you got it wrong. I think it's supposed to be every other day. No one in 32 years has ever said that. But when I show them, they go, I think you got it wrong. He said, no, I have it wrong, and you have it right, and that's why you're where you are, and this is why I weren't. You understand? Are you having a good time? I don't want to have to throw you out. So, the, you know, we're too sedentary as a society today. I mean, I, just to come in the doors of this building, I no longer have to open the door anymore. I just push a button, and the door opens. You understand? I have a toothbrush now. I just have to hold it and it's vibrating like great. I, I don't have to even move my hand up and down to brush my teeth. This is the world today. We are, like, we are way too sedentary. It's ridiculous. Compared to what our, we're designed for, Jeanette, we've got to find some substitution activity. That's the world. So with my patients, what really helped them is I'd get them to put a sign over their mirror. This is another day, another opportunity to shrink my fat cells down. See, why would you do that? Because the minute they would leave my office, you know, life gets in the way. Their car breaks down, the kids have some commotion at school, their husband gets tickets to some big gala, and there's some emergency, they have to go to the dry cleaners, there's some, something that, they forget it. They, every day you need to get anchored to the message. Right over your mirror, and like, oh, another day, another opportunity to shrink my fat cells down. Now, a lot of people can't do the activity problem, I know that, because they have a toxic mineral disease. It's called too much lead in their butt. <laughs> And it's widespread. <laughs> but we shall overcome. You understand what I'm saying here? There's a way out even for those people, and they don't need chelation. <laughs> the thing is that 30 minutes has to be a priority. You just have to find the time. And you have to put it in your day book and make sure it gets done. Because the choice is this, you know, either you're going to do that activity for 30 minutes a day, or you're going to be dead for 24 hours a day. What, what is the choice? Those are really... That's when you look at it that way, it's different. Now, some people want to jump, fat people want to jump in a swimming pool. That's the first thing they say, can I, oh, I want swimming, can I do swimming? I say, no, no swimming for you. Why is that? Because, I'll tell you why, because uh, swimming, your core temperature is 98.6 degrees Fahrenheit, roughly. Now, when you go into any swimming pool, it's never going to be that warm. It's always going to be colder than that. So when you get into a pool like that, your body doesn't know. You might want to stay in there for three years. It has no idea how long you're going to stay in there. So I'm going to have to preserve my fat and use it for insulation so I don't go into hypothermia. Your body resists burning fat in a pool. Plus, fat makes you buoyant. It takes you to the top of the water like a cork. And you simply go across back and forth. People are going back and forth using almost no calories to go back. Give me a lean person with no body. Stick them in a the pool. They'll be fighting for their life. They're burning calories. Every, the fat people are like a cork. Oh, you got to get them out of the pool. Take, reach them. Take them. Come on up here. you got to transport your body on land. That's how you get the very best bang for the buck. Now, there are... I'm fine exercising on my own. In fact, I like to go for runs on my own. It's sort of my meditation time. But not, a lot of people are not like me. They need, they, patients will say, oh, you know, I, the reason I didn't exercise yesterday is because my friend Sally couldn't make it. Say, what does it have to do with you? Well, yeah, I can't really go alone. Some people need to exercise with friends and in groups. They're gregarious creatures. So they, can, so they say, I can't do roving and cycling and elliptical. I mean, isn't it, can I go to a class? Well, you can go to class. I've seen classes work. Even for Tonda, I've seen classes help her on okay. She likes, she, she goes back and she lives in both worlds. On her own, also likes some classes. These are the classes that I've seen work for people. Body pump classes, Ashtanga yoga, really solid martial arts training, spinning classes. I wouldn't argue with any of those if you want to exercise in a group set. Okay, so that's shrinking your fat cells down. That's principle number one. Principle number two is you need to know how to feed your lean mass and then, of course, how to starve your body fat. So how do you, how do you feed your lean mass? Well, you know, when you are doing the endurance activity that you uh, were talking about, the muscles are, they've been storing some carbohydrates, and the muscles not only burn some of those carbohydrates down in the muscle, 
But when you start doing endurance activity the way I'm describing it in the, the aerobic training zone, the muscle says, hey, I'm going to need more carbs pretty soon. So the liver, which has been storing carbs as well, releases carbs into the bloodstream at a rate that's 30 to 40 times faster than under normal resting conditions. And those carbohydrates also go to the, the muscle in the form of glucose. And the muscle not only is taking fat out of the bloodstream to burn it, but it's taking some of those carbs out of the bloodstream. So you're depleting the carbohydrate fuel tank in your liver, and you're depleting the carbohydrate fuel tank in your muscles at the same time. And so now you have this depletion effect. Now it takes, so the muscles are burning those carbohydrates, it takes about five minutes from the time you start exercising for the fat to start arriving from the fat cell. So in the early stages, you're burning quite a bit of carbohydrates that are already in the muscle, your muscle stores some, and are coming, being delivered by the liver through the bloodstream as well. Now, so that means that by, after the five minute mark, there's like two, it's like you have two fuel tanks feeding into one carburetor in the engine. There's the fat fuel tank and the, car, and the carbohydrate fuel tank. And what's interesting is that if you run out of carbohydrates, you can't just run on the fat fuel tank by itself. A lot of people have enough fat to run from here to Australia, <laughs> but you can't actually do it. Because you, when you run out of carbohydrates, you can't just burn fat by itself. Fat burns, listen to me carefully, in the fuel of carbohydrate feeding. There has to be some carbs in your body. So these low carbohydrate diets, I'm sorry, they make you weak and tired you can't exercise, they make you sick. And this becomes very good news as we're gonna see later. So you get to a serious level of fatigue when you're in carb depletion. This is one of the major problems I have with low carb diets, so let's forget about that. So here's the thing, when you are exercising, not only do you deplete your carbs down, the muscles are, you're gonna make me do this every day, day after day, every day, day after day. The muscle says, the muscles you've been using are going to adapt, they will actually double the size of the carbohydrate fuel tank. Do you know that's one of the greatest adaptations of exercise? The muscle fuel tank, which used to be this big, is now this big. See, I'm making this a big issue because this is the catch-22. A lot of people who are overweight would come in and say, I don't know what it is. Everything I eat turns to fat. And I said, you know, they, and, and I eat only organic carrots, only the best. I eat good carbs, and, and look at me, I blow up like a, I think I'm allergic to something. I've got a metabolic, I think it's a thyroid condition. <laughs> Maybe. But in most cases, it's this, that the person hasn't been very active. So they eat even good carbohydrates. Now, when you eat carbohydrates and they get absorbed, they go from the bloodstream, most of them go to the liver, and the liver has to sort out what it's going to do with those carbs. So it converts all the carbohydrates into one common carbohydrate currency known as glucose. And it, says it takes the glucose and puts some into the bloodstream to maintain normal blood sugar levels, otherwise the brain's going to get very cranky. And it stores some glucose in the form of carbohydrate, in the, far, the carbohydrate fuel tank known as glycogen, so that between meals, after you stop eating, it can release them and keep the blood sugar sustained for a while. And then it says to the, it says to the muscles, the 600, 600 muscles of the body, do you need any carbohydrates down there? And the muscles say, to, and this person says, this dude hasn't used the ones you sent me three years ago. <laughs> so the muscle, so the liver said, but there's still some carbs coming in. So the, now at this point, the liver has only one option, has to convert those carbohydrates into fat. Carbohydrates get converted into fat in the liver when you eat more than your activity level has, has required. And then it sends them to the fat cell and the fat cells get larger. So, if you double the size of the carbohydrate fuel tank and you're depleting it every day, now you have a meal with carbohydrates. The carbohydrates come in, liver puts some into the bloodstream to maintain blood sugar level, store it, replenishes its carbohydrate fuel tank, and it says to the 600 muscles, you need any carbs down here? Yes, we're totally depleted. And so now the carbs go to the muscles instead of the fat cell and you replenish your carbohydrate fuel tank over the next 24 hours. Now you're using your carbohydrate foods as carbohydrate fuels the way nature designed it. Now here's the problem when people get addicted to their scale. Carbohydrate fuels weigh a lot. If you look at the molecular structure of carbohydrates, they're like carbons with water molecules hanging on them. Hydrogen and an oxygen and a hydrogen. H2O hanging onto carbohydrate. So they're heavy fuels. And so sometimes the, per the person will, their body shape will change dramatically even in the first month. But they go on a scale and it's like, I've only lost two and a half pounds. It's because their body fat came down, but they're storing heavier fuels in their muscles because they've doubled the carbohydrate fuel tank. Do you understand this? It's not a reflection that they're not doing well. They're doing really well. They're just storing heavier fuels. 
And so they've got to get past that. And I think you're understanding where we're going. So this means that about 50 to 60% of the, few, the foods you eat can actually be carbohydrate foods when you're doing this properly. Now, uh, the reason this is good is because, in case you haven't noticed, carbohydrates taste good. <laughs> right? I, I see these programs, you know, for the rest of your, your life, the rest of your life. You're never going to have bread, pasta, potatoes, or rice for the rest of your life. When people sign up for the, yes, oh, that's right, that, that's for me, yeah, yeah, that's really. So they go on a program like that, and you know these programs, I don't want to name names. I've seen them because they come to me after they fail on everything else, and they go on these crazy rules, and so they go, they're great until the daughter gets married, and they got into the dresses, until the anniversary party, until they, the holiday was over, and then and they blow up like a balloon. So how did they blow up like a balloon? Because one night at 3 o'clock in the morning, they just couldn't take it anymore. <laughs> so they tiptoe downstairs. They open up the cupboard. They have one cookie, the first cookie in nine months. You think you're just going to have one after nine months? You eat a bag, two bags, 10 bags, 20 bags. The next day, you're out of control, party size pizza. You're, you know, you're diving into the whipped cream. And they put on more weight than they lost in the first place. Ooh. And they walk around going, I'm such a loser, such a loser, what's happening? <laughs> no, the program was wrong. The program's idiotic. You need to have the window of carb eating because carbs are fun, carbs taste good. It'll let, a program that just allows you to cheat and have a good time in life. Anybody looking for that? And it's the only way you can succeed long term, I'm sorry. So what are the carbs that you do eat? 30% of all the carbs you have every day should be the excellent ones, what the ex now the really excellent ones don't have the best taste. I know that beans and peas and broccoli and cauliflower and cruciferous vegetables and you know, Brussels sprouts, and spinach and rapini, they don't taste the best. But those are the foods that will reduce your risk of cancer like nothing else on the planet. So whether you want to lose weight or not, at least 30% of your carbs every day come from the foods that help to reduce. We know that up to 75% of cancers can be re reduced through better lifestyle behaviors. And this is a key to it. So whether you're losing weight or not, this has to be in place. And then there are good carbs. They're good because they also have protective nutrients. You know, the fruits and grapes and watermelon and yeah, you know, yam sweeter, vegetables like that. But they're also sweeter, so they're more sugary. And they, can, they can bring too many carbs in at one time. So no more than 30% of your carb intake comes from what I call the good carbs. Then there's the intermediate ones, bread, pasta, rice, potatoes. And of course, you can have maybe 30% of your intake from those foods if you're doing the program that I'm showing you. And of course, if it's whole grain, it's going to be better when we're talking about bread and rice and pasta. And then you're saying, bad carb, what kind of nutritionist is this? <laughs> he has jujubes and jelly beans up there. He has licorice. Is this guy nuts? These are, these are not, these can't be foods on a program. I have to give people something back because I'm going to take a lot of things away as you're about to see. Things that have no place at all ever going into your body. I'm going to show you those things. So I you can't take everything away. So you have to give people back a small amount of cheat foods. They can pick from those things what they want. It's not unlimited quantities. Small little things just to get them through moments as we'll come back and talk about. The other way that you feed your lean masses with protein so the, the other thing I didn't tell you is that when you're exercising, you're burning fat that came from your fat cells. You're burning carbohydrates because your liver is sending it to the muscles. The muscle's burning its own glycogen stores down. But there's also a third fuel tank. It's weird. It, the, muscle, the body starts to break down its own protein structure. It releases amino acids that actually become sugar or, part, or they become intermediates. And the body can actually burn protein. About 5 to 10% of all the energy that you consume during exercise is from breaking down your own structure. It's this weird. It's as if you were in Alaska on a very cold winter day. And it's cold. And all of a sudden, in the fireplace, the log, the fire goes out and the logs are, you go, oh my god, I have to go out into the shed and get some logs and bring them in here and keep this fire going. I'm going to freeze. And then it occurs to you. I'm in a log cabin. All I have to do is set fire to the walls of the cabin. I get lots of heat. You, that's counterproductive, am I correct? But that's what the body does. It breaks down its own structure. And, it's, and that's why those long distance runners who don't get enough protein back, they look so gaunt and emaciated. You see them, you go, if that's health, 
That looks a lot like a, like a cancer patient that I went to visit last week. You, know, you, can, you can lose a lot of, you, if you're exercising the way I'm talking about, you've got to get protein back at specific amounts to, to replenish the protein you lost and gain the additional lean mass your body's now looking for. And also your immune system will break down because protein are the antibodies of your immune system. So uh, for a person um, who's uh, on a program like the one I'm talking about, you're going to have to get out six grams of protein for every pound that you weigh. If you're adding resistance, resistance training as well, you would add, you go to seven grams of protein for every kilogram, the per, for every pound the person weighs as we're going to see. So most people are going to need somewhere between 75 and 125 grams of protein a day. So with protein, you count grams. On this program, you count grams of protein. I'm going to show you. You get them from foods that are the healthy protein foods. Chicken breast, turkey breast, fish, you know, egg whites, cottage, low fat cheese, really low fat cheese, one percent milk, non-fat milk, kidney beans, or, uh, beans and peas. And so what you start to see is that a chicken breast, or three ounces of sliced chicken breast, is about, get this in your head right now, never forget it, 25 grams of protein. Same with turkey. Fish is just a little less. It's about 20 grams, the same serving size. Then there's a big jump down. Egg whites, there's about seven grams of protein in an egg white. Well, normally you wouldn't have one egg white, you might have three or four egg whites, which would get you to 21 to 28 grams. Three tablespoons of cottage cheese gets you to 10. People say, oh, I have a lot of protein, I have two servings of yogurt a day. That's 18 grams of protein, it's nothing. It's hardly anything. So you understand, it's not so easy to get those grams of protein when we look at the healthy foods or the healthier foods. And then from beans and peas, it's like four to seven grams in a serving size. With pasta, rice is only about seven grams, four grams. Soy products don't have a lot of protein. Uh, then you see bread and fruits and vegetables. They're very, very low. So this is why using protein shakes is extremely helpful. Anybody here using protein shakes? Okay, so I designed one recently, and we'll talk about that. But you can get about 25 grams usually in a serving size. So people say, as I'm getting older, my metabolism is slowing down. I say, once you do the activity I'm asking you to do, and you get the right amount of protein into your body, you'll actually gain lean mass, your metabolism will speed up, and as you get older, you'll actually have a faster metabolism.